all the, the pieces uh, of the pottery, then Joe would put a glue on all of the pieces at once and uh, and just fold it up together with these hands and uh, so we would come in, two or three of us, and stretch a rubber band cut from an old tire and, uh, and uh, snap it uh, around this. He held the pot together and, and we'd snap it around and then he would, you know, press it on and so that the whole pot was glued together in one in one process. Now, if there was a, a spot, a, a piece missing um, that he hadn't been able to found, find, uh, later when it was dry, it, uh, inside the, the bowl, he would press this kindergarten uh, a clay, this soft clay that doesn't doesn't get hard, you know, and he would press that over the uh, over the hole. Then this gave a backing uh, to the missing piece, and then he would would pour plaster Paris in into the uh, the missing place. And after that was all set and dried, he removed the clay from the inside, and then uh, he he would uh, color and uh, color this new. Uh, plain white piece of <laughs> plaster paris, he, he would color it and mark it and scar it or do anything and antique it so that uh, after he finished, you you couldn't tell from the outside uh, where he had passed it. He, he would just, you know, make it exactly match antique. This, this process he, he taught several other people and particularly the Mr. and Mrs. Fleming um, who uh, after he taught them how they had their own uh, Indian shop in Williams, and uh, but they became uh, efficient, and uh, then the museum um, hired them for years. They were in charge of their uh, um, their store, even uh, their sales place in the Northern Arizona Museum. But uh, Joe taught them all this his repair technique um, through the years. Um, he he repaired and restored and mounted um, so many artifacts that today we have a beautiful collection that we, we hope that it will one day be put in a museum all together as one collection under under his name in, uh, 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 as a memorial to him. Um, uh, along the way, um, he uh, had a friendship uh, with a very famous uh, um, man, an archaeologist, Dr. Heath. He was uh, Professor Emeritus from Stanford University, retired, and uh, I don't know how this uh, uh, friendship uh, ever started, but uh, uh, um, uh, they, they were so so con contrasted, uh, but somehow or other there was communication between them, and they, they immediately were devoted uh, to each other. Dr. Heath several times was our, our house guest, and he was about seven feet tall, and uh, uh, very slender, and Joe was short and, you know, sort of stocky, and they made quite a pair. But they had the best times together when uh, uh, when they would go to the cinders, uh, the cedars, <laughs> uh, on their Johnson. So uh, uh, Dr. Heath uh, became uh, uh, just almost like a, uh, well, he was a special guest in the family, but we welcomed him. So I can remember having a dinner party uh, one night, and uh, just just as a stunt, I required the uh, the guests to uh, make a response at dinner time, and I passed these slips out. And the one I gave Dr. Heath was, uh, give me ten reasons why you aren't a giraffe. And... <laughs> He got up and said he wasn't sure he wasn't, that uh, um, he was always sticking his neck out. Well, that was the year, and it was nice. Um, that was the year that we had we had the family um, uh, picture that uh, really uh, got some fame before we... Uh, we used it first as a Christmas card. We The whole family was singing around uh, the piano, and... Um, uh, Bob uh, Fonsky was taking the picture, and um, Bob wanted us to be singing in the act of singing, and so one of them suggested that we sing uh, 
about the old beer bottle floating on the foam, and the last line is, you'll find the beer all gone, and uh, at the word gone is when the, the picture was taken. Well, we're, we're all seeing, but uh, when we sent Dr. Heath uh, one of these uh, Christmas cards, he wrote us a beautiful letter about, uh, uh, about our family life, because he, he did enjoy it uh, so much when he came and stayed with us. But uh, he said, in examining the picture closely, that he knew that no, nobody had that many songbooks, and he, he knew that we, some of us were singing out of seed catalogs, and uh, that since uh, um, the mother was standing next to Daddy, and the expression on Daddy's face, he knew very well that I was sticking him with a pin. Uh, and I, I'm sorry that, that, that maybe Joe and Raymond can fill in some details about uh, that Dr. Heath because when he uh, passed away in his will, he, he left us, uh, in his estate, he left us two hand-hewn chests that he got from the Eskimos. Um, and we still have those in the family. They're made out of single hollow hollow logs and one of them has Joe has his father's pottery collection in what was his library in, in his law office uh, building and, uh, and and many visitors uh, are able to see it there but he really needs the space and uh, what we need is um, uh, is for the town uh, to set up a, a display space place for it and uh, we would really uh, donate it. We hope eventually to put it in what we're working on right now as the cultural center for Flagstaff. Yeah. Okay, um, our house grew by <coughs> degrees um, every time there was an urgent uh, requirement for more space. Why? We added another another room. We added an extra bedroom at the back, and uh, uh, one uh, and a maid's room, which uh, helped a lot. At least in the summertime, we had a, a living in uh, Indian girl usually, so that we did have some house help. And then we put a, a big laundry section on at the back. That was a was a great comfort because you can imagine how much laundry uh, a family of that size, um, active children. It was just it seemed to me the washing machine was constantly, constantly going. So the house grew um, and grew, and um, finally and there was there was a, a two-story brick house next door that um, we finally acquired after many years of negotiation. And instead of tearing it down, we uh, remodeled it and uh, and connected the two two houses which gave us a space in between the houses gave us a nice big new uh, dining room which we needed badly <laughs> with the uh, expanded house I, I said our house grew like an old mother hen uh, every time there were two or three more chickens white her room spread out and covered them all so uh, uh, finally the size of the house and the convenience of it it got to be what we call the regular college country club <coughs> and, and the, the girls had the privilege of, uh, of bringing, bringing home guests in the summertime. We nearly always had uh, a house guest. Um, uh, Jean brought Edith White for the whole summer. One year she was her roommate in, uh, in Tucson. And uh, we nearly always had um, uh, a schoolgirl um, house guest, even back in uh, Immaculate Heart High School days when uh, when the girls would come home, especially for Easter vacation, they uh, they would come. Bobby uh, Bobby uh, Bobby Tulin was uh, Rama's um, house, um, roommate in in Tucson, and she spent a lot of time with us. And uh, they are well, it just sort of made a social uh, sh social center uh, at uh, at our house, and um, the. Um, the a cappella choir um, that sang Easter sunrise service at the at the canyon. We had the whole choir to dinner. The, the, uh, sometimes we would have uh, a dinner. All their friends and their dates. We'd have a dinner before the junior proms and the, and the senior proms, and it was a place they could bring their friends to 
after the after the games and and after the uh, dances too and uh, the the doors were always open they felt very very free and comfortable to bring their uh, their uh, guests <coughs> the the setup of the house really adapted itself very well to social affairs having the big dining room and the big spacious uh, living room and and the, and uh, the den to the uh, the north wing of the house. Um, when the north wing was um, uh, remodeled, um, it was a great convenience because it it, it, it gave Daddy not only sleeping rooms uh, and uh, um, and a little den. It, it gave him a lot of privacy that was was a boon to him during all the rest of the years of his uh, his life because he had a private place to work. He had a private place to, to take his guests and, and business associates um, and all that and then it was an added attraction uh, when when we had social affairs because it had all the Indian decor and um, finally we set up daddy's whole pottery collection in there and uh, it was really a show place and a conversation spot too but uh, through the years our house sort of became a, a, a social asset to the whole town because <clears throat> there were any uh, dignitaries coming to town that needed we needed to have a reception or a tea uh, for them or um, any uh, new professors or events on the campus why uh, we offered our house as a um, uh, social uh, place to have it and so it really was uh, uh, not only a college country club, it was uh, um, a, a social asset to the whole community. Um, we we had um, in the back backyard um, a, a brick garage. It was uh, that uh, formerly, um, when it was first built, it was the carriage house um, for the people who, who built our house. Fries, Mr. and Mrs. Fry. Um, and we remodeled that and included um, even sections of the old barn and made a nice recreation place. We really thought about it as um, uh, a place for, for the children, just a recreation room. And it was so private because it was at the back of the lot, uh, back of the house. And so any activities out there just um, uh, didn't disrupt the house routine at all. And, and didn't disturb um, our, our daddy who needed the peace and quiet. And <clears throat> so the children, we had all the birthday parties, the children used it for all kinds of activities, constructive activities, uh, projects that, that we, ha we had um, uh, going at the time. And it seemed to me there were, there were projects going all the time. And then um, one year the university called and asked me to um, give a room uh, for the summer to a crippled children organizer, a national organizer. Well, anyway, Lydia uh, Lydia Newton um, was the crippled children organizer, and uh, we took her that summer, and she um, just simply won our hearts. For 11 years, the rest of her life, 11 years, every summer, she spent living with us and working for crippled children um, uh, both at the college and uh, uh, and extension work uh, to the reservation and all the neighboring towns and she was helping uh, the teachers in the community learn how to deal with handicapped children especially in the speech field uh, teaching the deaf children to speak well, we became so involved with the National Crippled Children's work that uh, in this little recreation house that we, we had furnished uh, and established in our backyard, uh, we organized um, uh, a duplicate bridge club um, a, as a, a feeder to um, uh, crippled children activities. Uh, we had established a rehabilitation center in the basement of the, of the high school. And um, uh, this uh, duplicate bridge club was, had a national franchise, and we could issue master points. And um, it, it was uh, it was beautifully patronized, not only by the townspeople, but by especially by the Sedona people. And uh, it it was uh, 
all the income from it. It was just entirely for the benefit of the Crippled Children's Rehabilitation Center. And uh, we, we had beautiful cooperation. The Gamma Phi Beta um, girls adopted us. A sorority ad adopted us. And they, on Wednesdays, they would send refreshments every, uh, every Wednesday. Uh, and uh, in those days, uh, the trade stamps were just being initiated, and people would give us their straight trading stamp books. And we bought chairs and, and dishes and duplicate boards and cards and uh, any, any equipment. And all our income for the next five years, everything went to the Cripple Children uh, Rehabilitation Center. After that, it was moved on onto the campus, and uh, uh, so we didn't totally um, uh, support it then because it wasn't uh, it wasn't necessary. But we, we the first five years of existence, we helped them buy a, equipment and gave this little feeder to them constantly. As an interlude, uh, an interlude. Um, in between the development of the um, of the house that eventually we called the bridge house, we first called it the gallery, and it's been used. Uh, I'll have to, it's a whole chapter on on the uses uh, of this little uh, private recreation house. I'll, I'll have to tell about that uh, another time. But um, uh, uh, Joe had had this. Uh, I think I've told you about how they took him to Mayo, so expecting to take to operate on. Him. For a stomach ulcer, he, they did operate on him. He did not have a stomach ulcer. Uh, and I'm sure I've told about that interlude there. But after that, he was trying to build up his uh, his um, blood count, and uh, the, the doctors recommended sun baths. And so um, between the, uh, the brick uh, carriage house, which we'd been using uh, as a garage and the barn. There was an, uh, a drive-in, a little alley space, a little uh, that that we uh, we built um, a cover over, uh, and uh, by by hanging up just a half half canvas so the morning sun could shine over it. Uh, Joe would take two to three hours sun baths there um, every morning. And this is how he got started feeding the birds. Uh, Lydia um, Newton gave him a some little uh, hummingbird feeders that he, he hung up and here's daddy uh, over uh, over the barrier uh, taking the sun bath and the place absolutely inhabited by the birds eating the, the, the honey and the sweet potions that they, they, they put in there and he never stopped feeding the birds from that time on he, he established uh, a little little bird refuge out in the, in the, it's his north north window, and uh, he, he he continued this all the rest of his his life. Was feeding the birds was one of his pleasures, and the uh, girls gave him a big bird book so that he could identify every every bird that uh, that came there to eat. And he had all kinds of little feeders and contraptions outside his uh, his north window, and it was. It was kind of a secluded uh, little corner that, that really made it, I'm sure it was a sanctuary. <laughs> now, they, um, the little recreation um, room then that we built in the, in the little cottage uh, back there, we, uh, at the time that we expanded it, and uh, we, we added a little uh, kitchenette with a sink and, uh, uh, and uh, just plug in uh, um, uh, cooking apparatus, you know, electric uh, appliances, and put heating uh, in it and carpeted and everything. And um, uh, that, that little bridge house notoriously was just practically at the service of the, of the whole town. There never was a, a coffee for a political candidates. The Democrats, the, the Republicans, the, the sororities had their breakfast there, the, uh, the, their initiations, their um, special, uh, special events, the Gamma Phi Betas, the, uh, the Beta Sigma Phi's, the, um, all the Kappa Gammas have had many, many luncheons there. Um, we even uh, shop, uh, even had a, a Negro wedding uh, reception there that I got a great deal of criticism from many people in town for this, but Charlotte's daughter, I, I should I should have, have mentioned Charlotte someplace along the line because there were about 
eight, ten years that uh, that Charlotte uh, was uh, really a part of our, our high household. Um, Charlotte uh, uh, and Clarence Boyce, with uh, one daughter, was all of their family, Gertrude, <coughs> came, uh, came here uh, one summer looking for work and and I, Charlotte became a, a cook in our house, cook and housekeeper, and I got um, uh, Clarence a, a, a job as bartender and, and keeper at the um, uh, at the Flagstaff Country Club. The, our country club was quite quite new then, and they gave him living quarters. I think she, I think that Clarence really came by himself first. Because I know I gave him blankets and pillows and bedding uh, to to live out at the country club, and then Charlotte and Gertrude came. Well, Charlotte was <coughs> she she's a very very um, in, in, uh, intelligent, uh, uh, cultured, um, uh, colored woman, and uh, uh, she was a great uh, great asset to us in many ways. And eventually, Gertrude uh, Gertrude grew up, uh, graduated from high school uh, here and uh, went into nurses training finally became a trained nurse <coughs> she went to work in the in the california i i had helped her get into nursing school too with recommendations and uh, and all the influence that i i could muster well eventually um uh, she's uh, a trained nurse in california and she is engaged to marry a doctor um well, they were married and came here to meet her family's friends, and they came and asked me. Uh, first, they asked me to help them get the Flagstaff Country Club uh, to let them rent the place for a wedding reception, and I got turned down there, and we ended up letting them use uh, the, the bridge house. And... Uh, uh, before this event came off, somehow or other, the word got around the town, and I was criti criticized severely by many people for allowing Negroes uh, to use this place uh, socially. But um, as it turned out, um, uh, they they had a most beautiful reception in every way, and they they were just just as well behaved as. Um, any high class people any any place and they had beautiful food and they had a receiving receiving line and uh, uh, a place for the gifts and they, they had a very very beautiful affair and after afterwards um, uh, Charlotte sent me uh, fifteen dollars uh, as a contribution to uh, to cripple children uh, because of the of the use of the place, which was a, which was really very generous of, of them, and you know in that condition, but nobody could ever have had a group of people who behaved better. So all the uh, anticipation uh, of the townspeople and the criticism had to be <laughs> discounted all the way. Yes, it was a very lovely affair and something that the colored people deeply appreciated all of them did <coughs> there was one social um event that was uh, um ha had quite a, a scope that turned out to be a very beautiful uh, affair thanks to the help of all my lovely teenage daughters um there never was a, a social event that they didn't mostly do the do the cooking and hostessing and they've been such a great help to me all through the years uh, but this this affair was instigated by um, a, a national march of dimes that uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt d began and, and each state was asked to instigate a first first lady's tea in other words the governor's wife and the legislators uh, uh, wives and all uh, would be special guests to any events that raised money for the march of dimes um, and um, uh, um, McFarland was our governor and uh, Mrs. McFarland very gracious lovely uh, lady <laughs> so uh, we organized uh, I, I was representing uh, the the entire county um, and so people came from Grand Canyon and uh, and uh, Fredonia and Winslow and Williams and 
and Sedona uh, from from all around and uh, uh, to this big tea party. And we had we had um, some uh, crippled children who they were representing um, the the March of Dimes. Um, uh, they were chosen, I guess, in each state, different ones, and so they brought these these children who had been helped by the March of Dimes and. And they were they were present there, but uh, it was a big uh, social um, affair, and we did raise um, a great deal of money. We had um, orchids for the um, the special uh, the special guests, and we had quite a few pictures, uh, you know, newspaper pictures and all, and, and uh, um, the. Uh, as long as we're speaking about the uh, the rehabilitation uh, center, when I first organized the duplicate bridge game as a feeder uh, for that, uh, the first hundred dollars that we uh, that we raised was uh, uh, was publicly uh, given at a big uh, uh, dinner at the Monte Vista Hotel that was countywide. Uh, crippled children's uh, um, all the crippled children's workers were here for uh, more or less of a conference. And um, because uh, this was a, a, an idea of, of each town doing something to support the the crippled children movement in their um, in their community, we wanted to to get as much um, uh, publicity as we uh, as we could on this. Um, so uh, the first hundred, this was the first hundred dollars that we were donating. Um, to the the rehabilitation center to cripple children, so I went down to the bank and asked the banker if he would have a big, uh, a blown up, a great big size check made of this hundred dollars. He did. He hired an, the Valley Bank hired a, an artist in, in town uh, to exactly duplicate um, their. Uh, their check, and they made a check for me about uh, 12 inches wide and about 24 inches long, uh, and that was the check that we presented. <laughs> it, was a, it was photographed. Uh, it was our, our first check, but it did give us a, a lot of publicity because uh, that first hundred dollars was so important, and it was uh, it was hard earned too, and it was shared. I mean, the earning of it was shared by so many people, and it was just the beginning of years of help that we we have given to the Crippled Children um, Fund. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the the weddings the uh, uh, of, of five daughters uh, as each one uh, took its turn had its own own drama its own little crisis uh, and uh, um, really the, these romances uh, should have should be uh, written about but uh, of course each daughter uh, will have to enhance it because they'll have to put in the details but. From my standpoint, the the overall details, uh, the thing that I know about uh, Betty Jones, who was the first of the brides, um, Betty was going to school at uh, what was ASU, our college. Uh, uh, it's NAU now, but it was 